Hello everyone, my name is Mr. Nettleman and we are here to do one thing and one thing only, that is discuss Mother. Note that this analysis is based on the Wii U Earthbound Beginnings release. Our story begins with Wanchigasato Itoi, a man of many talents who was inspired by the first video game he played, Dragon Quest. For the next two years he played games obsessively, noting what he would and would not do and he eventually read out designs for a title of his own. Certain adults of the era were skeptical of video games, but the late night show, 11pm, had a gaming feature on which he toy defended the hobby. Nintendo president Hirochi Yamauchi happened to be watching and was impressed by Itoi's arguments. He was invited to Nintendo to have with PR for Nakayama Miho no Tokimeki High School, one of the earliest dating sim titles. In a talk with Shigeru Miyamoto and others, he showed them his designs for an RPG that would be different for its use of a modern setting. Miyamoto, a man skeptical of RPGs, skeptical of yet another celebrity-endorsed Famicom game, skeptical of whether or not the copywriter could pull this off, and skeptical of the idea in front of him, rejected the proposal. Itoi was supposedly so upset that he cried on the train ride home. But a later call from Nintendo said that if he was serious about the project, they would support it and he enthusiastically agreed. Itoi had hoped that like with advertising, a team would immediately be assembled. But Miyamoto explained that development protocol called for one signing and committing first. He gave him a text adventure games documentation and said Itoi had to do something similar. Miyamoto knew the quality depended on how much effort he was willing to invest and in turn Itoi reduced his work hours to complete the document. Yamauchi, who enjoyed Itoi's works, established the development company Ape in Ichikawa to, as he put it, made sure the game was made by talented individuals and the ideas did not dry up. Itoi was appointed as CEO. Miyamoto put together a development team from both Ape and Pax Sofnica, beginning work on ESP1. Itoi wanted the work environment to feel like a high school club working out of an apartment, which Miyamoto attempted to satisfy. Writer, designer, and director, Itoi dealt with a project that was demanding and the daily commute from Tokyo was exhausting. Rumors surrounded the development believing it was a vanity project or that Itoi was in it for the money. Even the development team was wary of the man himself. Miyamoto was also criticized for abiding by a celebrity, but he continued to stand by a toy in his vision. On July 27th, 1989, ESP1 renamed Mother was released to the public. The name from a John Lennon song that moved the toy deeply, hoped the game would move others in the same way. We are here to ask what does Mother add to the RPG mythos? And in his liberal borrowing from existing RPGs, what does it do with those elements to execute his vision? And in his attempts to move people through an experimental project, how does this game go about this and is it successful? Mother was an ambitious project by people new to the genre who were tried heavily by the development. On one hand, that ambition shines in certain places. Yet at other times, you can discern Itoi's attentions, but his execution falters, feeling as if for every good point there is a negative one in exchange. Mother's most successfully detailed and layered asset is its setting. You wake up in your home, the house is shaking, you fight off a hostile lamp, and save your sister from a doll that reveals a mysterious melody upon its defeat. Your father believes some evil is at work. You discover your great-grandfather's research into psi or psychic powers and must go on an adventure through rural United States. The game uses the Dragon Quest format, relying more on the experience of locations, people, sense of adventure, and atmosphere rather than the main plot. Stepping off your lawn, you are confronted by crazed neighbors and local wildlife. The classic RPG tropes of waking up and going on a journey are present, but within the backdrop of the 1980s with its era-specific design sense, color, and dress. RPG staples are recontextualized with department stores for shops, payphones to save, and debit cards to withdraw cash. The overall feeling that punctuates the game is a collage of Americana. The Midwestern presentation, abundance of greenery attempting to replicate the countryside, and small town USA color the game. But there is also a patchwork of outer city suburbs, Florida-like swamps, Nevada-like deserts, Midwestern mountains, and big city rows of buildings for variety. Saturating the air is the innocent side of the good old days with the peaceful country atmosphere, homey music, appropriate colors, and good-natured people to capture the feelings of a 50s Smallville or even a Norman Rockwell painting. And as we have already seen, encounters include out-of-control, crazed elements of the modern world. 
The pastime of baseball and slingshots inform weapon choices. Bottle rockets are popular, a comic book like Smash exists for critical hits, and burgers, fries, and sports drinks are available as items. The characters look like they stepped out of Peanuts, a classic representation of American childhood. The far more untamed landscapes and old-timey houses are traits that may stretch the influences back up to even 100 years. And for flavor, you even have hippies from the 60s and World War era veterans. In the midst of this is a coming-of-age story that will attempt to work itself out within this world. The alien invasion whose disturbance causes chaos is a homage to Hollywood cinema and television stories of aliens, flying saucers, and abductions occurring in the backwoods. The iconic Starman's aesthetic is akin to that of Gort from The Day Stood Still, but rounded and obtuse to make it appear muscular, yet like a parody at the same time. The tone of 50s sci-fi while taken seriously at the time, comes off as quaint and hokey today, but Mother manages to use it as part of its eccentric atmosphere. In many ways, a toy is a man seeing elements of the West from the East, or at least his own point of view. And the game's mishmash of content may perhaps go beyond that with old-school mecha designs reminiscent of Tetsujin 28 and homages to European literature such as with the Cheshire Cat. The sense of exploration has been transformed to fit the way we experience the setting. Mother, like so many games, follows the Dragon Quest II formula. Linear at first, but then becomes open world. But in many RPGs, overworld travel is metaphorical. The map is an abstraction, the space representing miles covered, cities are single squares, and you are as tall as a mountain. The novelty of Mother is in its simulation of real space. Areas feel wide with less abstracted geography. Cities have packed buildings inspired by a toy's Chicago visit. Suburbs are spaced out. All of it an interconnected, mostly seamless map. The sense of real space immerses us in a different way into the specific world a toy has built. I give the game credit as nothing looks pixelated and the environments are smooth. But while I've praised the setting, atmosphere depends greatly on aesthetic. And the problem is, quite frankly, that the art is ugly. To the point that it harms the visual storytelling. The particular choices of green, white, and others are dry, bland, and lifeless, making the trek through the west less visceral. For interiors, I understand that apartment stores are supposed to be like 80s Bloomingdale's, but the specific shade chosen is off-putting, hurting how endearing this is all supposed to feel. The game's idea of a dark house consists of scattered assets scattered across a black screen. The absolute worst is that every room is a repetitive trapezoid, the dungeons being endless halls of them which is boring artistically. It makes areas such as these factories more tedious than they should be. The sprite art does not help as they're sloppy and lazy like terrible versions of Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Magic Ant is meant to be this otherworldly wonderland of the game but tends to fail due to all of the above factors as well. While I am sympathetic to how someone upon release may have been taken in by the attempt at fairy tale appearance and music, it has not aged well and does so little for me. The weak shade of pink and white, the way the colors spill over, and blandly drawn buildings take me out of the game. Everything in the game just looks so faded. Even the white bars look old and decrepit. All of this spoils the experience I'm supposed to be having. When artistic design fails, the function of the visual storytelling through setting is damaged. In short, when the visuals lack visceral power, it can ruin immersion and the experience of the world. But this alone cannot ruin the overall format, so perhaps the narrative can save it. The goal of our journey is to find the eight melodies for Queen Maria to remind her of a song she once knew. The search for music has a wonderful fairy tale beauty to it. A fantasy queen who lost her tune and the poetic mystery behind its disappearance. The problem is that's not how the early game begins. Even after your father tells you to journey to find out what is causing chaos in the world, your goals are vague and as a result I felt unmotivated going forward. I am fine with no clear plot and villain at first, but you at least a discernible goal or mystery with intriguing clues. After the first melody, you proceed into smaller individual stories much like the Dragon Quest games. But the question becomes one of their quality use of that framework. You must venture into a graveyard full of zombies, almost cartoon-like in fashion to save Pippi Lundgren, an XP of Pippi Longstocking. It is essentially this version's game of saving a princess early on. So far, decent enough. 
The second melody involves buying a baby canary and returning it to its mother in a canary enclave. As quirky as the elements are, an actual sense of story is non-existent. The weirdness is nowhere near charming enough to stand alone. The third is more interesting with a singing monkey saving the zoo from a star man that is causing the animals to go wild, and ends with the monkey giving you the melody. The intelligent monkey is again charming and even a bit mysterious since he can sing. Using a zoo as a dungeon is creative, and the star man is our first insight into the larger alien invasion. But at the end of the day, it's merely fine. There are fun players and individual events, but they're presented so simply they don't have much weight to them. Upon entering a cave, we can use telepathy to enter Magic Ant, like a child entering a fairy tale. I commend the idea of using Psy to interact with the world, one of the earliest games that allows you to use your abilities in such a way. We meet Queen Marie and are finally given our reason to find the melodies. The fourth one is located in a haunted mansion where at the bottom the piano plays it for you. Again, the idea of the dungeon and its background has interesting components, with a homage to how western fiction playfully deals with such areas, but in the end it's just a backdrop without anything to really sink your teeth into or story or any kind of reasoning. An oddball cactus that's easy to miss gives the fifth with absolutely no fanfare, the following melody is granted to you by a dragon who reads his sheet music after you defeat him. While again lacking in story, I did like the unique take on the fantasy beast. You obtain Eve, a robot built by your great-grandfather to protect you. When it sacrifices itself, the seventh melody is revealed. But does that mean George planned for the final one to blow up? And the final one is at his gravestone, which I suppose makes sense. Mother begins linear, then proceeds into a non-linear MacGuffin hunt in the vein of Dragon Quest II, a template popular among early RPGs. However, much like that game, it isn't a very strong hunt, often cited as how a toy was influenced by Dragon Quest, but then will go on to justify Mother by mentioning how it supposedly improved upon that game. But I have often wondered what the context of what a toy's words were, considering it shares both the benefits as well as the flaws of the second game which was two years old by then. By the time Mother was released, Dragon Quest 3 had vastly improved the model, and 4 which went even further was around the corner. Mother's stories surrounding the MacGuffins are not compelling and are sometimes non-existent. Your obtaining of them is often anticlimactic in nature. Any explanation as to why the holders have them which could have been intriguing is absent, and there isn't enough of a mystery to chew on in terms of theorizing how they ended up there. Within MacGuffin hunts, the high of obtaining one is supposed to inspire searching for the next. This game's failure to accomplish this kills my motivation to find the next. There are those who enjoy the story, but many are already franchise fans. And I do wonder if that comes from reading back what they loved about future games back into this one. Also, some of the hints for figuring out certain objectives can be incredibly obscure and easily missable. Mother tries to rely on the search for melodies giving the feeling of being ethereal and mysterious, but it never manages to ascertain that level of power and influence as an atmosphere-driven game. Considering this is part of Mother's overall concept, the result was a monotonous feeling journey. I felt a disconnect throughout the game, feeling little as I went along. What colors so much of Itoi's work is his trademark dialogue and humor with his own brand of being offbeat and weird. The NPCs convey much of this with great lines. Some comical, some philosophical, some thoughtful, all with a childlike sense of eccentricity. There are about 300 NPCs with almost completely unique dialogue. Taken together with everything else we see, including cats swimming on the ground and babies being able to communicate telepathically, the particular form of silly and absurd come together to play into the unique atmosphere a toy tries to shape. It has some of the strongest NPC dialogue of the time. If I had to say there was a downside, it's the consistency. I don't always think every piece of dialogue hits the mark. I do admit, however, some of this could be the low caliber of early 90s localization, which could have been unsuccessful in bringing out the Japanese text's flavor. The game's strongest moments are where it goes all out. The dance show where you get on stage and do a little number. Driving a tank to defeat a giant robot boss. Being overcharged to stay in a hotel in the haunted city only for the concierge to reveal he's a starman. And getting Eve to mow down enemies. 
When the game unveils its most endearing ideas, it manages to capture my attention. Though there are moments where this fails, such as having to fly a plane three times, and having to empty your inventory to have 12 spaces to hold enough tickets for a tank ride. One of Mother's most successful achievements is music as a storytelling device. Keiichi Suzuki, a Japanese rock band leader well versed in many genres, was responsible for the arrangements, and he's good at setting the tone. Hirokazu Tanaka, who already had a few Nintendo soundtracks under his belt, had some issues with what a toy wanted, but eventually was able to find harmony with a toy's vision. The overworld themes mimic Dragon Quest II, with the first theme, Pollyanna, feeling like that of the Lonely Traveler, playing when Nintendo is alone, while the more joyous Be and Friends plays when you have a party. Flippant Foe and Yuka Desert sound like old folk music. The underground and ghastly themes have this classic, creepy, hidden sound to it. Humoresque of a little dog sounds like the Beatles when I'm 64, while the hippie theme sounds like Chuck Berry's Johnny B. Good, adding this offbeat western flavor. Magic Ant's music is a relaxing, fantastical song, fitting as it's a fairy tale rest stop. Some simply function for their setting, such as the factory theme with its slow, mechanical rhythm which works in contrast with the fast-sounding battle theme, and sometimes the music is simply just gorgeous, such as Snowman with its feeling of snowtime beauty. And even though I'm not personally fond of the 8 Melody song, I admit that's more taste driven, because much like everything else I deeply respect the composition work. By far in terms of sound quality, Suzuki and Tanaka's work deserves to be spoken of in the same vein as the best of NES games. The enemy design also plays a part in how we experience the world. Real animals are reimagined in silly and goofy fashion. Whereas more silly ideas come in the form of the disembodied eyes of your mother, father, and Groucho Marx, Magic Hand has among the most unique such as with the teddy bear. And of course you have the aliens themselves. My personal favorites are the flying saucers, anthropomorphized vehicles, and any of the disturbed humans. Like certain RPGs of the time, some enemies express more personality in combat. Groucho is more or less harmless, and if you wait, He'll grant one party member some experience. Many fights play to a variety of musical tracks, and similarly to what Kawazu was doing with stage encounters, he has moments such as how zombies are posing as certain NPCs. It is implied that the influence of the aliens, namely the final boss, is what is causing people and animals to become violent and distressed, giving the existence of encounters some good gameplay story synergy. What hurts the game, however, is how poorly translated some are from the original concept art. The skill of taking an original designer's work and transferring them faithfully or altering them if necessary is an art of its own. Ideas such as modern animals in silly display is sound, but their awful in-game art can sometimes miss the mark. At times, certain expressions end up being completely off. What is supposed to be fun and whimsical ends up being derpy and the faded appearance I previously mentioned dulls each of them. On top of that, the game can be lacking in its amount of enemies or doesn't disperse them well. How many times do I need to see Dr. Distortion or the Scrapper? Rather than endearing, a lot end up ugly or off-putting. Overall, the monsters do manage to convey the game's ideas, but do also have mixed success in terms of quality. One particular concept that works is the recruitment of party members. Lloyd is a coward hiding in a garbage can who you can befriend with explosives. To recruit Anna, who is optional, you must return her hat to her. And Teddy, again optional, can only be gained after engaging him in a manly duel. These manage to be quirky and give the sense of actively attempting to make a connection, thus befriending the character in question. Two of these being optional only heightens that feeling, making it feel as if you were going out of your way to do this. The team dynamic includes Ninten as a strong attacker with healing and support Psy. Lloyd specializes in using offensive items. Anna began the trope of females wielding frying pans, but she is primarily your major mage with offensive and healing Psy. And Teddy, unfortunately a temporary character, is a physical wrecking ball. The use of Psy makes this one of the earliest titles to not use straight up magical abilities and gives a different feeling. One idea that looks sleek is the sliding UI, giving battle some visual uniqueness. However, the overall schematics fall short in execution. Ninten learns many buffs early on, and it is interesting to make the protagonist a buffer, but he spends an annoyingly long time without anyone to buff. I never felt compelled to have him buff himself, 
as it felt more worthwhile to just keep attacking. Lloyd's attack item specialty is unique, certain items being one use and others multi-use before breaking. However, A. The early ones are woefully underpowered, B. They eat very hard into your cash, and C. The inventory size to amount of items ratio makes Final Fantasy II blush. I think it may be the worst of all NES RPGs. When money becomes more plentiful, you can stock up on plasma beams, sticky machines, and super bombs but that's quite late and easily missable by the player, misleading them into believing Lloyd is completely useless. It's too bad Lloyd's concept was not balanced better since I enjoy the idea behind his character a lot. As for Anna, her stylist is interesting. It is similar to Dragon Quest and it unfortunately doesn't bring many new ideas to the table. On top of that, it lacks a substitute for Dragon Quest's grouping system. But it has some novelty, such as how PK Freeze Gamma reduces enemy HP to critical, though these obviously only work on certain enemies. Beam Gamma can insta-kill an enemy while the highest level deals high damage, and Fire Omega can defeat all enemies. But her learn rate is really awkward. When you first gain Ana, you have to grind for levels to get her up to speed during which she blazes past certain skills, making them useless. Even after, she learns so many so quick that many become obsolete rather fast. In the end, I found that for most of the game, I just spammed PK Beam Beta and some form of PK Fire, unless I found the enemy susceptible to Freeze Gamma or Beam Gamma. As a result, many battles felt unstrategic and not very well thought out. Some of the more interesting Psy were meant to be experimented with, but I didn't want to because of how poorly optimized this game was. More on that in a moment. And while I'm on the subject of battle, I should also mention this game lacks auto-targeting in a time where games were beginning to correct that. Overall, the dynamic of the team is novel, but his execution did not follow through with it, especially in an era where RPGs were devising more interesting strategies and as a result, it ends up boring. I personally enjoy challenging RPGs even among the slower moving 80s titles, but Mother crosses the line from difficult into frustrating. The early to mid game is fine, but you eventually run into increasingly unbalanced enemies. While the overworld encounter rate is fair, the dungeon rate becomes absolutely abysmal and rageworthy. Eventually this culminates into constant encounters into enemies who do obscene damage. On top of that, the enemy has a decent smash chance, with those moments being almost a guaranteed one-shot. The game at some point becomes a chain of constant difficulty spikes rather than a curve. I was particularly frustrated when I had a character die near a town that had no revival. Add to this self-destructing enemies and so many easy instant death situations, and it all just becomes really annoying to play. The imbalance is on level with Dragon Quest 2, which again, was a two-year-old game. Perhaps what is truly the worst part of the gameplay was the poor optimization that feels years old for 1989. Everything in the game is just so slow and takes time and exacerbates everything else. The battles were even slower than its contemporaries which weren't exactly blazing fast themselves. Everything from choosing attacks to going from person to person was so slow. It is what deterred me from experimentation and I just wanted to get through the entire game. I eventually became very impatient with the experience as a whole. In the end, it was a complete slog. There are a number of additional amusing ideas that play into the gameplay world building synergy. Checking items gives amusing dialogue with a lot of personality. You may also check enemies in battle, which can also lead to fun flavor text and even comedic enemy motivations. There are certain items such as swear words and love which do nothing in battle. Certain items exist merely as jokes or gags. The real rocket is interesting even if it is a big waste of money. Using bread to leave behind breadcrumbs to act as an escape is rather charming. Two unique status afflictions are Nintendo's asthma and colds. With the former, an NPC can cough on you and give you a cold. With the latter, certain conditions in battle may trigger it. Both are amusing but can be frustrating since you may be in an area with no doctor. Items to relieve these ailments may be expensive early on as well and you may not be carrying any to begin with due to the inventory. These were meant to fulfill the function of reminding you that this is but a child, but it is too bad they end up as nuisances. Much has been made about the game's grindiness. As someone used to old school RPGs, this did not bother me, at least at first. There are two issues. 
First, when you recruit a character, they are level 1 and you must grind them out every time, which is time consuming. Second, no matter how much early RPG experience I have, not even I have become enough to ignore Mount Atoy, an area the namesake admitted was not playtested to the point it is better to run from every fight. Itoi stated that he wished for the game to be difficult, but by the time Mother was released, games both prior and shortly after began to rely more on strategy, with grinding being present but being nowhere near as overwhelming. The game surprisingly implements diagonal movement, which it deserves credit for. However, movement has serious latency issues, forcing you to press the D-pad hard for walking and it's even worse for diagonal movement. The fast travel skill teleport is a slick homage to Back to the Future, speeding off to warp away. While the reference is fun, crashing means the skill fails which means having to set it up again, risking encounters you were probably trying to avoid to begin with. Dungeons have a rather unique aesthetic for the time, almost isometric in their view with wall height appearing huge in comparison to Ninten, making you feel small. That said, the actual dungeon maps are rather uninvolved in terms of their capacity for exploration. The either this door or this door setup is rather fine, but the game becomes overly reliant on it and it feels unsophisticated compared to how other NES dungeons would have more subtly dealt with the idea. And sometimes the same aesthetics make it hard to navigate certain dungeons as you find that too many areas look the same. Returning to Magicant, this time to mention its gameplay significance, it is supposed to be the game's hub. With the Onyx hook, one can warp there any time to recover, store or take out items, and purchase better equipment. With the queen there and the feminine coloring, it almost feels as if you were entering a motherly abode. Fitting considering who she is and the title of the game. Money flows in relatively fast, allowing you to purchase the best equipment rather quickly. Not that the gear is overpowered, far from it, but it's that Mother contains a very weird economy, where there isn't really any new armor after a certain point. One annoying aspect, however, is since you gain the teleport psi very late, if you warp to Magicant, you'll have to trek back to wherever you last were on foot. Overall, in my analyses, I attempt to get caught up in the world or charm or plot or whatever the game is specifically aiming for as well as going into it to experience it as if I were playing in the 80s. Mother aims for the experiential, attempting to bring together setting, atmosphere, music, comedy, and its most important moments. But the faltering execution means it is a mixed bag of ideas that work and don't work, meaning that while I acknowledge what it is attempting to do on a mental level, I was not truly able to feel and experience it on an aesthetic level overall leaving the game to never reach that level of transcendence it truly wanted. Once you bring the melody back, the queen remembers that she is Maria, Nintendo's great-grandmother and the caretaker of Gigas, the leader of the aliens. She and all of her realm vanish. It's clear that a lot of work was put into this final illustration, one of the most meaningful on the NES. Beyond Mount Atoy, you come face to face with Gigas. The battle itself is quite excellent with Gigas taunting you while your attacks have no effect. His onslaught is incomprehensible, beyond the senses of human beings. Bringing the Lovecraftian sense and feeling of the unknowable and expressing it within the battle system. The only way to defeat him is by singing Maria's song until he has had enough. As a result, the battle is one of survival, tanking his powerful blows while singing as much as possible. This makes for an intimidating and unique final boss, one with steadfastness and compassion rather than outright force. If I have any complaints, it's that I was exhausted by the game at this point and lacked investment, as well as Gigas lacking a sufficient amount of buildup. The former isn't the final boss's fault, but the feeling is there nonetheless. One of the takeaways from Mother is its purposeful use of the hero's journey in a different format. Rather than a legendary lineage, your grandfather is a scientist. Your absent father plays the role of a king. You save a damsel in distress. You cross the threshold, travel into the unknown, have the metaphorical meaning with the goddess, enter into a road of trials, you face caves and even the dragon, there is the proverbial atonement with the father, and we have the final battle with the source of all trouble. 
Mother at the very least deserves credit for being one of the earliest games to execute the fantasy version of the hero's journey in a modern context. There are also a few other things of note. Your father is mysteriously absent apart from phone calls, perhaps reflective of a toy growing up with divorced parents. Mother as a whole is perhaps a hyperbolized and abstracted view of a toy's coming of age. He grew up in a non-standard home, having to face a chaotic world with challenges that felt frightening and strange in order to grow up. One moment in particular I'm unsure if I'm supposed to view positively or negatively is Nintendo and Anna's Dance and Confession of Love. Is this supposed to be a celebration of childhood affection? Or are Nintendo and Anna doing what they think they're supposed to do as romantic leads without an understanding of what they're actually doing? Or is it poorly executed which explains my inability to truly tell? It could also be, like perhaps much of the rest of the game, a Peanuts style of storytelling. Charles M. Schultz's Peanut comic strip, most likely an influence, feature children, perhaps without realizing it, facing grown-up concerns and ways of thinking, especially the anxiety and worry of dealing with the real world around them. While the exact way a toy and Schultz craft their dialogue and stories differ in style, both seem to be aiming for similar goals. Certain reviewers claimed Mother is a parody of RPGs, but I believe it's more that a toy used console RPG storytelling to make a comedic game, as the actual RPG concepts themselves are not outright parodied. It's more of him taking the glass that is the format and filling it with himself. One last thing I wish to discuss is the main character of the world problem. Are other kids also told by their dads to go out and discover their latent psi abilities? Why Ninten and his friends? At least the much debated Chosen One prophecy trope at least gives context in a story such as this one. Itoi has remarked that Mother is more feminine in quotations. By that he means it focuses more on sentimental aspects whereas many RPGs had a sense of manliness. Themes of empathy, compassion, and the effects parents have on us exist among many characters, even Gigas. He had felt betrayed when your great-grandfather stole alien data and returned to Earth. Ironically, he who felt abandoned ends up committing actions that cause others to lose their own parents, implying the pain of missing parents can cause people to inflict the same pain upon others. The final battle brings everything together, with you using Maria's song to fight, for even the main villain had a mother. There is no denying the game's ideas are certainly ambitious and its attempts are admirable, though many of them are executed in a rather simple manner and are not truly fleshed out to their full potential. As a result, there is that lack of impact and thoroughness of storytelling we keep coming back to, because so much of this doesn't hit with full force. Perhaps that's why when a toy made the sequel, it also functions as a quasi-remake of this game. After Mother's Japanese release, Nintendo of America had to undertake a huge localization effort due to the game's plentiful text. In addition to translation, they had to comb over every word to see what conformed and didn't to early era censorship policies. Other necessary changes were to avoid lawsuits with Charles M. Schultz's estate, to simply making things more palpable to Western audiences. But also with the toy's approval, they made gameplay changes for a slightly more balanced game. They revised maps to reduce difficulty, added a run button which really just doubles the game's speed, added the check commands, changed the Psy learning order, removed the time machine which merely activated a skit like the real rocket, to replace it with the more useful super bomb and generally alleviated a lot of the frustrating elements while also adding in more helpful ones. An epilogue was added to detail what happened next, as was a roll call, a new credit sequence, and a post-credit sequence, all accompanied by rearrangements of certain songs. It was said to be released as Earthbound with an 80-page strategy guide and the soundtrack. It was previewed in Nintendo Power as Nintendo wished for this to be a success. Work was complete in 1990, but after a 1991 delay, it was cancelled entirely. Localization producer Phil Sandhoff stated once the Super Nintendo appeared, NOA decided it would be too expensive to produce and market. However, the difficult translation project led to changes within Nintendo, as they began a more concerted effort to keep international audiences in mind when developing games, working much closer with Nintendo of America. 
In the early 90s, fan translation group Danny Forest were working on a translation when they discovered the game collector Kenny Brooks possessed a beta cartridge. Backed by a crowdfunding campaign, they paid Brooks $400 to use the game to dump the ROM. The title screen was altered to read Earthbound Zero. Two in-game anti-piracy measures were found which hackers eventually circumvented, leading to a newer re-released ROM. But about 26 years after Mother's Japanese release on June 14th, 2015, with an announcement by Itoi himself before the Nintendo World Championship, Mother as Earthbound Beginnings was launched on the Wii U Virtual Console. Turning back the clock a little, a sequel would come in the form of Mother 2 for the Super Famicom. In localization, it would inherit the name Earthbound while also being released with a strategy guide. The game takes place long after the original, though very much inherits the first game's spirit. To promote the upcoming Mother 3, Ape and HAL Laboratories began development on Mother 1 and 2 for the Game Boy Advance, a compilation of both games. Modifications were made to allow the game to fit the portable screen, while sound quality suffered due to the Advance's sound chip. The build of the game is actually that of the cancel localization, complete with every change made, just with the original Japanese text. This was perhaps due to Sero being instituted the year before, perhaps leading a toy to believe it would simply be easier to use this version, leading to a rare case of reverse localization. Another reason was perhaps because a toy believed the balancing was better, and maybe he was hopeful for a western release. Additional changes include the game no longer being tile-based, allowing for freer movement, along with a few very minor changes. It was released in Japan on June 20th, 2003. The game was rumored for western release, but this never manifested, most likely due to Nintendo being unsure of interest. Clyde Tomato Mandolin would later translate the Mother 1 portion, modifying the game to include an easy ring which doubled experience and money from battles, while also reducing random encounters. He also made modifications to restore as many assets and texts to the original Famicom release, to make it an experience as close to the original as possible. As a result, at the time many saw this version as the most ideal way to play the game. Mother is many things. Experimental, different, and a labor of love. It attempts to use the experiential component of Dragon Quest, but rather than Hori's fairy tale esque fantasy, it's a toy's offbeat and fun yet somewhat frightening world. But in so many areas, it does manage to miss the mark of what it's trying to accomplish, with so many ideas falling short of being as compelling as they could be with so many great ideas that fall short of being as compelling as they could be, despite being subpar games themselves. Even I can feel the depressing world of Final Fantasy II or the futuristic dystopia of Fantasy Star II, and damningly within its gameplay, it is a work that said, oh, me too, too late, as it was outdated upon release as RPGs within the same time frame had undergone a technological and developmental revolution. As a result, it's an absolute slog to play. While Mother certainly has historical importance for multiple reasons, and fans of later Mother games should certainly pay pilgrimage to it, it is difficult to recommend as an RPG to almost anyone else. Overall, it's a game with ideas that are better than its execution. I hope that you enjoyed this video. Please like, subscribe, and comment for the Algorithm Lords. If you would like to support the channel for as low as $1 a month, you may do so on my Patreon. You can also follow me on Twitter to keep up to date with me. Next month on February 14th will be the Dragon Quest 4 episode. Thank you for watching, and God bless you all.